let's go ahead and get started and I can keep admitting people as they arrive. So first of all, Lucia and Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. I have been looking forward to this conversation for a few weeks now and it couldn't be more timely, um, especially with things like the 2021 um, physician fee schedule just being finalized. There's an awful lot of movement and I can't wait to learn from you. For folks on the line, um, Journal Club is absolutely my favorite event every month. We keep these groups smaller. We are absolutely discussion focused. So before I go ahead and introduce uh, Lucia and Robert to you, um, let me just run through a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces so that you know how to participate today. So first of all, um, just a quick note, and this is important, we do record these sessions, so keep that in mind as we move forward. That is um, great, however, because what we'll do a little bit later today is we will post this to the DIME website. So if any of your colleagues aren't able to be here for the discussion live, they will have access to this after the fact. Journal Club really is an Ask Me Anything session. Uh, Lucia, Robert and myself were just preparing for that. So they are ready uh, for your questions. They will do a short presentation, really giving you the author's perspective on their brilliant health affairs blog. And then we're gonna throw the discussion open. We've even changed the format of how we run these, um, making it easier to have a discussion for, uh, forum. So please feel free, either raise your hand, I'll keep an eye on the participant list, I'll call on you, you can pose your question directly and ask some follow-ups. Or if you're somewhere where you can't chat right now, that's also absolutely fine. Please feel free just to put your um, questions or comments into the chat or Q&A and I'll be sure to be monitoring those. And then, as I said, slides and recording will be available after the session. So without further ado, let me go on and hand over to Lucia and Robert. I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself um, to, the, uh, to the folks on the line today, uh, share a little bit about your background and expertise. Um, and I'm going to tee this up a little bit uh, for the audience and then let you guys tell the story. I think there's a terrific uh, story around how you two met um, several years ago now when you were both in DC. So Lucia, why don't I ask you to uh, tell that story, uh, do your intro and then hand over to Robert and the floor is yours. Sure, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, well, I'm gonna introduce myself first and then tell the story. So I know some people on the call, but for those who don't, I'm Lucia Savage. The mnemonic is Lucia like fuchsia. Um, and I'm currently Chief Privacy and Regulatory Officer at Omada Health. Prior to joining Omada Health, I was Chief Privacy Officer at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. And although the word interoperability will cross my lips a couple of times today, I'm not really here to talk about those rules. That should be for another journal club. Um, but prior to joining ONC, I was a, an attorney, a senior attorney at United Healthcare. My portfolio actually included many things other than privacy, including um, support for um, HEDIS-based performance measurement, patient-centered medical homes, e-prescribing, and sort of all things in what was then in the mid-aughts emerging digital care. This is before high tech. Um, and I bring that back to my work at Omada Health, where my portfolio is quite broad and includes everything from CPT codes and reimbursement to um, privacy and security. But um, the story of how, uh, and one more thing, my talk today, although I'm at Omada and my boss, you know, reviewed the blog before it was published, is really my thinking alone and shouldn't be attributed to Omada. So um, everything I say today is personal and my personal views. Um, so the way Robert and I met is, for those of you who know DC, you'll know that the main, um, the Hubert Humphrey building is right near a metro station and at that metro station is a Starbucks. It's a very popular Starbucks because the coffee there is better than the coffee inside the HHS buildings. But more importantly, it's a really important watering hole for those early morning meetings with people that you don't wanna have to bring through security and all that kind of stuff. And that is where I met Robert, a mutual friend said, hey, you should come meet this guy, let's have coffee. And I'm like, great, Starbucks is at the top of my metro escalator. Um, and, and that is how we met. And it was probably late 2014, right after I started at ONC. Um, the mutual friend is, uh, I'm a Democrat appointee, he's a Republican. Uh, Robert was currently work, then working on Republican staff. And I think that our conversation and the friendship that's evolved over the years is kind of a hallmark of the best in policy making when it's the ideas that are more important than who brings them. Robert, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'll do this really quickly. My name is Robert Horn. I've spent about uh, over 20 years in, in healthcare and healthcare policy um, from a governmental approach. Was the staff director for the Ohio House Health Committee, served 10 years in the Congress, uh, five for the Energy and Commerce Committee, helped author 
a number of pieces of legislation, uh, uh, antibiotic drug incentives, uh, the reform of the SGR into what is now known as, as MACRA, and then a, a whole host of provisions that became law under the 21st Century Cures Act, including uh, digital regulation by the FDA. So uh, with that in mind, I think looking forward to the conversation today. And Lucia, did you want to start us off in terms of the, uh, the health affairs article, or do you want me to? No, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. And um, Michelle or Jennifer, could you please bring up our first slide? So um, Robert and I actually spent a lot, a lot of time working on how to visualize the problem that we wanted to write about. And, you know, 2,500 words in health affairs is really about 15 or 20 hours of conversation. Um, and here's the, the essence of what we observed from our respective purchase, mine trying to figure out how to get Omada Health, which is a digital healthcare provider, paid uh, for benef Medicare beneficiaries for all of the services we do, not just Medicare DPP. Um, and and, and look, working with different organizations in DC. And what we realized is that sort of everything that Medicare decides to pay has a box that it fits in. And we've listed them here, the Part A inpatient, Part A outpatient, Part B, that's the physician fee schedule, uh, the Part B durable medical equipment, labs, uh, Part C, which is Medicare Advantage, and Part D, which is drugs. And then we, in addition to those seven silos, which all operate quite distinctly, and if you study the regulations as much as I do, you can see that one agency and another agency, that, those silos hardly ever touch each other. You have CMMI and you have national coverage design. And then somewhere else in the HHS world, you have the FDA approving devices and drugs. And that digital technology really should be part of the delivery of all of those different silos. But it really wasn't being treated that way. It was really being treated as potentially an eighth silo as its own little thing, a digital therapeutics vertical or or some kind of weird niche product that may or may not even be relevant for Medicare beneficiaries. And that was kind of the tee up to what we were trying to write about in our, in our article and to conceptualize not only what the problem was, but to conceptualize some ideas around how we might at a um, structural level fix this. And we're not talking individual test models like CMMI does, that's not, that's too small. It tests one model, it has an actuarial basis. We're talking about how to change the structure of the thinking and the approach and how the um, decisions and uh, policy weighing that CMS does as it makes payment proposals and works with the AMA might change over time. So could we have the next slide and then I'm gonna hand oh, it off to Robert. Lucia, oh, you wanna add? Yeah, no, and I think, please go to the next slide, but it's, so, you know, as, again, just take a step back for a second. The really good maybe dichotomy here from a perspective standpoint is you read the news, digital health has so much potential in healthcare. You look at government payment programs like Medicare and you see a much different picture. That's what we, Lucia and I are trying to solve for is we have a healthcare system that was created largely, or at least the, the blueprint was created in 1965. And ever since then, we've been adding on top of it. We've never done a look back to see, look, 70 years in the future, products, services are working in much different ways than they were in 1965. Maybe the problem here, the reason why we see in the news the potential, but not in the system, is the system itself. And to put that in perspective, you know, ACA insurance coverage is a way of paying for and accessing the healthcare system. What Lucia and I are trying to do really is get down into the system and make the system uh, better able to recognize uh, innovative technologies. And by innovative, we don't just mean digital, also drug and device. We're starting to see some really neat and unique things happening in, in the development space. And ultimately what Lucia and I wanna do is try to figure out a way that the system can better recognize these things and better take advantage of them. So just to add on that a little bit, the, the basic concept of what we're trying to accomplish is um, without, while recognizing that, for example, inpatient care is quite distinct from ambulatory care, quite distinct from drugs, the, the idea that in the 21st century, in the fourth industrial re revolution, digital services really are everywhere. How do we 
ensure that as Medicare is thinking about each year's rule or new rules, they're, they have the tools and expertise in-house to actually understand it. And I'll tell you a little anecdote and I'll get to the Prevent Diabetes Act in just a minute, but one of the things I hear all the time in my work for Amada is, well, what about fraud? What about program integrity? And that is a super important question. I think that's true as a patient. I think that's true as an advocate and policy analyst. And I think that's true as a taxpayer. So how do you, how do you answer that question? You answer that question by actually having a substantive conversation about what should digital care companies use as fraud controls? What is the standard? Bring that standard to the industry. And then what about if the digital care companies actually have better record keeping because of digital audit trails than do paper-based companies? Bring that to the agency. And that is a piece of dialogue and expertise that has um, not been, a, I, don't, I can't say that it's missing from a staff level, but it certainly has not been a source of discussion in my uh, four years since I left uh, HHS. So that's just one example. And so that's kind of what this, um, what, we, uh, what we outlined in the, in the blog and what this uh, graphic illustrates, is right? this idea that digital is everywhere. That's actually what the fourth industrial revolution is about. It's everywhere. How do we make sure we're taking the right advantage of it? And secondly, what are the tools that the agency needs to do that? You know, clearly they might need some more expertise. Clearly, they might need some authorities that um, help coordinate across the units. And uh, just to let you know, ONC does have the National Coordinator for Health IT, but that person doesn't write Medicare rules. All they are is a resource for Medicare. We need that level of knowledge within the Medicare agency itself. And, and so finally, how do we, how do we create a... Um, some markers or guardrails so that as Medicare is looking at digital technology, what would be the hallmark of good and bad digital technology? And we landed on the idea of functional outcomes and evidence. A functional outcome being, uh, I'm going to pick on DPP because it's the thing I know the best, uh, but if you have in-person diabetes prevention program and virtual diabetes prevention program and the health outcome is the same or better, why exclude one of them from coverage? And if I can just maybe before pivoting on to the to Prevent Diabetes Act, because it's, it's a really good example of the problem today uh, and the potential of tomorrow. But just going back to the slide for a second, it, it, what Lucia talked about really is the problem. If you notice, we're talking about um, aligned functional outcomes, which appears around a patient to be a unified goal of the Medicare program. It's important to note that we talk about the Medicare program, <coughs> excuse me, as a single entity, but if you look at this graph, it's nine separate programs all acting independently in ways that do not uh, best allow the system itself, the entire program, to create aligned functional outcomes between the nine silos. That in essence is part of the way forward as, as Lucia, Lucia mentioned. Uh, we've, we've got some thoughts on that, I think maybe in terms of the next step or the way ahead. But really, that ultimately is the problem. We can't get to align functional outcomes as long as the program acts as nine different programs. So um, we've sort of planned a lot of time for discussion, but before moving to discussion, Jen did ask me to sort of address the Prevent Diabetes Act. And I will say, first of all, that the Prevent Diabetes Act is something we at Amato worked um, with the legislative sponsors on, independent of this um, blog, but the two are related. And here is how they re are related. And for those of you not following the news, um, on Tuesday, CMS issued a press release just about the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program saying that no, there was no way it was going to expand MDPP to virtual programs, even during the public health emergency, for a bunch of really illogical reasons. I'll let you go read it. <laughs> um, but yesterday, um, uh, the House uh, Senators, uh, Representatives Rice, Reed, DeGette, and Butterfield introduced the House version of Prevent Diabetes Act. And for those who are the policy wonks, it's the exact same language as the Senate version. So we're very hopeful that we can move that bill quickly. What is the point of that bill? That bill does one thing and one thing only, if passed. It forces Medicare to allow virtual DPP suppliers to apply to be a Medicare supplier in the program and all of the Medicare program integrity tool 
rules, the high fraud bar that these types of suppliers have, all of that just kicks in. The Medicare rates just kick in. It literally just requires a new modality to uh, be allowed to ask to supply Medicare beneficiaries. It doesn't do anything other than that. And uh, the reason it's related to this, uh, this blog is because that is essentially what the outcome of a change in Medicare should be that the analysis Medicare is going through should be about the effectiveness, the functional outcome, the clinical evidence of that effectiveness, the evidence of beneficiary choice that they like it or don't like it without presuppositions about what 70 year olds like and don't like, not on um, uh, the fact that it's delivered in a different way. As I've said many times before, we don't call it fax care just because we started exchanging health information by fax. It just became an exchange of health information. We changed the modality of that exchange a few times, HIEs, EHRs, next, coming up next year, APIs. The modality shouldn't matter if the functional outcome is the same or better and the cost is same or lower. It just shouldn't matter. And so that's what we're trying to accomplish with, with Prevent Diabetes. Robert, did you want to add anything else before we get to Q&A? No. Well, yes. So I mean, just a couple of things, maybe, you know, number one, it, you know, ultimately, I think we're with prevent diabetes, we're talking about, and again, this is a separate issue, but we're talking about the potential of a technology to transform Medicare. And then we're utilizing one of the nine payment systems to try to get there. That That's the best we can do right now, but that's the problem. Um, and it really represents, I think, a good example of the way forward. And so before getting to q and I think it's just helpful to underscore that Lucia and I intended this article um, to not just be a thought piece. Um, we we appreciate our own thoughts, but we don't think so highly of them that we just want to publish them. So we have a really a model that we're working on to put this philosophy into action. Um, and you know, part of this process right now is we have a concept, we have a way forward. It's very grounded um, in part of the problems. And it, we think the solution is not trying to recreate the 1965 system. It sounds big and it has the potential to have big impacts. But the type of reforms we're thinking about um, really are intended um, to be least disruptive and most beneficial to everybody going forward. And so we're doing um, panels and speeches like this, you know, with an eye on really taking in people's thoughts as well. It, you know, before it's it's done and 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 all of that good stuff. And so you know, along with the questions, if folks have thoughts or ideas that they like to impart to us, I think Lucia and I would be all ears. So thank you very much for the opportunity today and we look forward to question and answers. Fantastic, those remarks were terrific. Jim, I'm actually gonna to come to you first. Lucia, you put a pretty thoughtful reply into the chat, but I wanted to see if you wanted to give your question voice, Jim, as we dive into our discussion. Uh... I have a thought, maybe I'll-, I'll... Right, There we go. I think, oh. I think I got my voice out, out here yeah, now. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> so, you know, I, don't, I don't claim to fully understand the system completely, but but I really viewed uh, you know, Medicare Advantage as being sort of a Kaiser-like ACO system. And I guess I'm probably a little ignorant given the, the, the question that, that there's this, this hurdle you're putting in there about Medicare suppliers. So- Sure. You have to become a Medicare sure. supplier. No, it's, it's, a, it's actually a very astute question. So theoretically, if you have um, a business model where the, the insurance company is fully capitated, meaning they're 100% at risk for uh, uh, having to overpay, more, pay more than they expected for care, then theoretically, they should be able to use anything they think serves the needs of their beneficiaries. But that is not, in fact, the case um, in all respects for Medicare. Of course, a Medicare can offer any digital thing it wants, almost any digital thing it wants as a supplemental benefit, like Medicare plans have Fitbits as kind of an add-on to lure in their beneficiaries with their uh, Part A and B dollars. But that's not the same as being a Medicare supplier. And a Medicare supplier actually brings to that Medicare Advantage plan certain other um, benefits like incentive payments for quality and preventive services. And unless you can cross that threshold of being a Medicare supplier, the Medicare Advantage plan can't get those incentives. So that's one. And two, you know, Medicare Advantage plans are really giant bureaucracies. And I have uh, personally written this message to at least a dozen of them. Unless they're contracted, you know, the counterparty, the OMADA, the whoever, 
um, can be a Medicare supplier, they actually think there's some kind of prohibition against including them as this additive freebie, which may or may not have health benefits. But when you're the digital care company and you know and have evidence and RCTs, and it doesn't matter if you're us or Propeller Health or, or any of a dozen other companies in many other clinical verticals, if you know that you're providing medical grade care, you kind of don't actually wanna be treated as a freebie. You wanna be in the medical care business because you're providing medical care. And so that's, you know, Prevent Diabetes Act is literally just a, 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 a stick in the crack, right? To try and lever the door open um, in this idea that the modality that supplier rules should be as neutral as possible as to the modality because we now have this digital revolution in healthcare. Yeah, and Jim, okay. maybe just one, thing, just that one thing that just quickly to add to that, under a modernized system, I would completely agree with you that Medicare Advantage can be a way to test um, new ways to use, use innovative technologies and payment uh, coverage and access. And today, I think what Lucia's is getting at is it, it the system doesn't function in a way that Medicare Advantage can really be used that way. So, you know, I think, I think what we're looking at is once the system is modernized, a number of efficiencies start happening through an alignment strategy that really can, can do some wonders for healthcare. Yeah, great. That's very helpful. Fantastic. So just, to, oh, Marcus, you have a question there. Do you want to unmute yourself and pose it directly to Lucia and Robert? Yeah, I just found myself wondering to what extent uh, traditional providers are friends or foes here. Um, uh, you know, I can say the AMA, I mean, the AMA was a supporter of the Prevent Diabetes Act in both houses. So I think that's pretty, pretty good evidence about where tr providers are. I don't know, Robert, what you want to add? Well, no, so I, guys, I think it's helpful to keep Prevent Diabetes Act and modernization separate in your minds. And I think from the larger issue, there's the potential that a number of stakeholders could feel like their business model is going to get disrupted. And I think that has been a traditional barrier in the past to reform. It's if we don't know what's going to come down, sometimes what we have looks better. I think what Lucia and I are working on is a policy that is very cognizant of that problem. And we think we have a way to, to, to basically um, minimize disruption. And actually, if we're thinking about this correctly, a modern Medicare program uh, will need to still continue to work with the different payment systems, you know, so the physician payment system, the hospital payment system. So, you know, previous efforts were always antagonistic and oppositional. We think we found a way to create a collaborative way forward. And we think within that, some communication, I think, and, you know, some good type of education on what this does and doesn't do will be helpful, but ultimately we expect that various stakeholders should all see a unified positive view uh, on this going forward. And, and, and that's right. And if we do, if we, if we, if we can get this right, then we should no longer hear from doctors and nurses, well, I'd like to do this, but I don't get paid for it. Right. The doctors and the nurses who want to use digital tools in their practice are also suffering from this lagging reimbursement standard. Yeah. If I may jump in, um, again, I really appreciated, um, even just the diagrams alone have been really helpful just to understand what the uh, framework is that Medicare is working with. Um, one of the things that we've been hearing from different entities is let's just optimize the current benefit categories or silos. So are there ways that we could just make DME perfect and so that everyone can fit into it. So that way then we don't have to worry about all these other ideas. And I'm grossly oversimplifying, but I'm curious if that has come up um, and I don't mean to misrepresent other organizations' perspectives, but it's something that we're just struggling with in terms of how much can we push forward versus how much do we just have to say, let's optimize with what we have already. So, so I, I think that that's- Can you jump in for one second, Lucia? I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I'm a horrible moderator. Megan, will you introduce yourself? And then Jim and Marcus, we will go back and I will ask you to do the same. Just to put these questions in context, Megan, go ahead for now, finish this conversation, then we'll go back and carry on. Y'all can tell I wasn't expecting this to be a video call. Um, I am the executive director of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. So we're looking at this from a notion of let's create a benefit category, as Lucia mentioned earlier, looking at some of these other digital health technologies. But we've been hearing others talk a bit more about let's just make things that exist 
just better. And then we can just move on with our lives as they stand. Well, sure, you want to start that one or you want, or you want me to? Uh, I'll, no, I'll take a stab at it. So I think that that is right for something that is clearly, clearly belongs on the digital. Uh, so Demepos is digital, uh, is um, device, uh, wait, Durable device, life. medication, I can't remember. It's, it's like, a dev um, I'll dig it up. I'll Google it while I'm not on mute. But anyway, most digital care is actually not, does not actually belong in that silo. Mm -hmm. Right, anyone who's doing asynchronous telehealth, Cirrus, Wheel, uh, Hims and hers for that matter, um, you know, Omada, none of that is a device. It doesn't belong in that schedule. We might use digital equipment and that is where the evidence and the functional outcome and, and the real world evidence of the outcome can come from. But this, the activity itself is not actually device driven mm -hmm. activity. So that's one problem with that approach for the uh, universe that is digital care. Um, secondly, I think that it doesn't account for the, the fact that done right, digital, I'm just gonna say stuff because we don't know if it's clinical decision support making yeah. a lower grade provider better at their job or a digital device providing evidence of outcomes or, 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 or even a warning system that allows the uh, acute care, you know, inpatient hospital setting to swoop in and prevent worse care, for example, from home monitoring. All of those things could be happening and um, putting digital stuff in one category actually retards the development of these other areas because it becomes the focus of people's attention. And Megan, if I can just add That's to that, just to step back from a macro standpoint, I mean, it's the durable medical equipment, right, category. It's, it's, so it's very specific to what goes into it. Yes, you could do anything possibly to it, but the problem is you haven't solved the problem with the other eight payment systems, meaning that if you've done something in DME POS, it doesn't mean it's going to get into the hospital fee schedule. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to get into like the physician fee schedule the way that you need it to. I think what Lucia and I are arguing is, yes, you can double down on, you know, augmenting the different silos and you will make improvements, but boy, you're leaving a lot of potential on the cutting room floor. Why don't we go back and make a system that can better recognize improvements in DME or POS mm -hmm. so that we can get to this functional outcome you know, goal that we have. We think there are a lot of ways forward to do it, but, you know, arguably Lucia and I are not going to be doubling down on the current system because it, it people have tried that for 30, 40 years and the outcome has always been the same. We, we get very, very little benefit and we leave a lot outside. Well, I really appreciate both your perspectives on that. It'll be um, and I will stop pretending to almost be a moderator of some sort, but I look forward to understanding more of like what your next steps are and how you really look forward to taking this in a meaningful way um, to different policymakers and making this actually reality. So that's great, thank you. Megan, great question. Casey, I'm gonna to come to you with the next question, but Jim, let me come to you first. Quickly introduce yourself because I didn't call, I didn't ask you when you asked your question. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Jim Dasher, uh, I run a uh, consulting firm called uh, Digital Health Advisors and we work with digital health, early stage digital health companies to try to work on their business models and try to make them be successful. Terrific. Thanks, Jim. And thanks for your patience, Marcus. I'm going to ask you to do the same. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marcus Tagus, and I'm the Chief Health Officer at Bind, which is an innovative health insurance company. And um, we're wrestling with these issues. We're actually building and designing a health insurance model from the ground up. And so we're, we're building it to be digital friendly, um, including things like, you know, making sure we have a, a place in our ontology, a benefit archetype for uh, uh, digital technologies as sort of DME and also digital providers as providers. Um, and so great conversation. I unfortunately have another meeting that's scheduled over, so I have to drop. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to further conversations on this topic. It's a huge issue. And unless we change the structure that we CMS has, we're, we're going to have a hard time uh, making progress with Medicare in particular. So thanks for all your great work on this. You're welcome. Thanks for being here, Marcus. And uh, this is going to be a priority for us and our colleagues at ATA in the coming year. So yes, lots of lots of work to support this tremendous piece from Lucia and Robert. Um, 
Laura, I want to recognize that you were fastest button for uh, durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies. So uh, you yeah. get the, the, I know, the gold keyboard of the, uh, of the meeting. And with that, Casey, let's come to you with your question. Hi, yeah, Casey Quinlan here. I'm, you know, many things, um, mostly an annoying person from the patient <laughs> row who um, tends to, you know, just sort of, you know, it's like explain like I'm five. I, I actually do understand the issues at play here, but one of the, the things that occurs to me often in discussions like this about, you know, the digital transformation of healthcare, long, I'm, I've been waiting for a long time for it, it hasn't happened yet, but how much resistance to shifting to, more to a digital delivery landscape, at least for some parts of care, is um, how much of that resistance is embedded in the desire to preserve on the part of whoever those resistors are, their slice of the $4 trillion a year healthcare revenue pie. Now, granted, the $4 trillion is not all Medicare. Do yeah. not mistake me. I do not think that is the case. But certainly Medicare, and as someone who is now a Medicare be beneficiary, I've seen behind the curtain from the user side and, well, I have opinions but I won't express them here. Um, but I mean, it's interesting. It's nice to have the full coverage and not have to ask, I have original Medicare, not have to ask a lot of the questions you have to when you have commercial insurance. But at the same time, there are trap doors and you don't, you shouldn't have to be me to figure out what the trap doors are. But anyway, so the digital resistance, where's it coming from and how related to the money is it? So let me, yeah. Yeah, me, you go ahead, Robert, you go so, ahead. So um, as a policymaker on the Hill, I mean, and just looking at this, I think, or as a staff to a policymaker, pardon me, um, you know, ultimately, if this really goes back to, to the policy approach, and I can't underscore enough how important the approach is to success or failure, a lot of the approaches that we've seen on digital or modernization in general have been predicated on the proposition of we're going to go into the payment systems we're going to get market share away from somebody else. And that's an immediate fight. It happens every year in the payment systems, every year in the rules. Lucia and I have learned a lot from that. That ultimately that can be successful, but that's that's in essence creating a war potentially among business models. That if you do reform a different way, and again, there's details to come on this, there's an opportunity to take advantage of something that is uh, that runs across all different stakeholders. And that is, if you ask them, not about a bill, but could they use innovative technologies digital differently in their business and would they want to? The answer will always be yes. And arguably, if we can create a system and do it the right way, those different stakeholders can drive reform um, and ensure that the reforms we're talking about don't need to be the destruction of their business model can actually be complementary and can actually make more of it in ways that we all benefit as a result. I, I think that's exactly right. And I think a really important thing to think about as we, you know, we're, we're almost 20 years into this century. So it's 20% over now. Um, and, you know, the iPhone was released 13 years ago in 2007. And we're now, what, iPhone 12? I don't keep track, but something like that, right? iPhone 12. Yeah, iPhone 12. Um, I think that the what I said before really holds true, but we have to, we have to pull, we have to elicit the stories about it, right? The, the delays that are occurring in this, you know, 30% of the total healthcare GDP is, we're just going to call it Medicare and Medicaid. That's roughly population-wise about right. But it has this, you know, ripple effect, whatever they do ripples out elsewhere, that it's really retarding. It's a drag on innovation. It's a drag on physicians changing the way they practice. I think uh, in there's so much ability of physicians to have, if we do this right, to have relief from some of some tasks in their lives so they can concentrate on the things at the top of their license that they're really, really trained for whether that's through the AI and the clinical decision support, which is changing every day, or the, the way a care team works connected with digital tools that are supported by that clinical decision support, that's the Amata model, or whether it's the way that 
uh, digital tools that really might be devices under the DEMEPO schedule out in the wild are feeding uh, understandable and actionable data to the care team from a person's actual life or even something as simple as we now through Zoom are seeing what patients' kitchens look like when we're worried about what they eat or what their floors look like when we're worried about fall liability. All of that stuff is stuff that really becomes enabled through the use of these digital tools. And so um, not to put too fine a point on it, it really is everywhere. And what we have to do is foster people's acceptance of that and, and their, give them the tools to think of, to take advantage of the fact that it's there as they do their reimbursement planning. And, and by the way, Casey, I'm just waiting to join you there in Medicare because if, if, because I'll just be a pest. I'm like, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Why do I have to do it this way? Why, you know, like, I'm just going to be one of those smart, smart aleck patients who asks a bunch of questions about why the system is so old. And I've, been, I've been training clinicians for years. <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, really terrific question, Casey. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, Laura, I'm going to come to you next if you want to unmute yourself and do a quick intro and then pose your question to Lucia and Robert. Good thing. Hello. And I recognize that I randomly turned my camera on, but I did not enjoy staring at a picture of my name. Um, <laughs> So I'm Laura. Uh, I currently work for a division of Politico that does regulatory intelligence and kind of boutique consulting um, focused on uh, devices personally, but we do the whole FDA. Um, but my background is in that consulting for that really fun handoff between the FDA teams at your regulatory strategy team and the market access launch team. Um, so I have a really kind of basic question, um, which is definitional alignment. Um, between under Medicare, what is considered a product. So I've always pronounced it Demipos, and I'm gonna stand That's by right. that. That's right. <laughs> um, what is a product under Demipos when you, where we have the definition of, you know, Medicare supplier and what is actually a service? Um, so like the big example, obvious, not obviously, but where remote monitoring kind of lives is in the home health PPS and, you know, the not paid for under BIPA and now it's paid for as of 2019, but only kind of video calls. And now we have this IFR from April that says other things from via telecommunication or whatever it says. And then a kind of a further point, what do we do about, you know, multiple function devices that are neither a product nor a service uh, Lucia, you were talking about clinical decision support software. So what happens if it is a multiple function device and how do we kind of, I don't know if anybody has, has if the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Group has ever looked at any of this, what the coverage with evidence development could even look like to demonstrate um, kind of, so yeah. that was an, in, that was not a helpful question, but there it is. <laughs> Let me start on that maybe and then Lucia invite you to, to jump in. I think you know, Laura, you really talked about something that, that's unique. And if I can just go a little bit deeper on it, maybe as a reflection point. I would literally love that. Okay. So how the FDA looks at digital products today is much different than how maybe Medicare, the Medicare program has looked at uh, products traditionally. And that really is at the root of our of the article. Uh, the Medicare program views a, views a product as a uh, fitting into a category and then a bunch of rules follow and those rules are different for all of those different silos. Um, and Laura, actually, this gets to the Software Act. It's, it's a piece of legislation I worked on. Um, and what the Software Act did is, that for the first time, it gave the FDA a different way of thinking about a product for digital. And the reason is because digital is a product that doesn't act in ways that anything else does today. It's data configured in a way to produce an action supported by a platform. And so what the FDA started to do a little bit is, and there's a lot more here, Laura, but it started to think about product approval, not based on the entirety of the product, but based upon a specific function. Right. And what the FDA is starting to say is, um, the function is what's important here, not the product. That in essence is the same argument that we're using for the Medicare program now. It is the function of what we wanna get done 
which is good outcomes and at basically an efficient program. And Laura, the FDA experience is one lesson that we think Medicare can learn from. Now, there are a number of different things that have to work together, we think, to make reform work. But one of them is, and we hit on it in the paper, allowing the Medicare program to think about products not as a product, but, but as, uh, a function. as its functional benefit, right, to our ability to run a healthcare system and, and the functional benefit to the patient, right? And this is that combined with other strategies that allow us to create this holistic Medicare program instead of nine spokes, function and thinking about function as a core component. Lucia? Yeah, I just want to add two things. Remember, clinical decision support is not a product or a device subject to FDA regulation, full stop. That was the essence of that section of cures. So it's actually not relevant to think about clinical decision support and the Demepos schedule because they just never cross paths. Now that has been sorted. Thank you, Robert and team. Um, the second thing I want to say is telehealth is a very interesting thing because every, and I wish Anne was here today, but everyone uses this term. And I'll just give you my take on what telehealth means. First of all, the, C the rules CMS has right now were set by Congress a long, long time ago based on pre-smartphone technology I can't even imagine how far back it went, but I'm, I think it was like cabled, dedicated cabled video cameras, like a long time ago. Um, and it was about where Medicare would pay when that video conferencing occurred. And that's the only thing the statute is about. We'll only pay when it occurs in this place, between this place and that place. But actual telehealth itself is defined by state law because actual telehealth is the states tell the professionals when they can do services that are not touching a human being and when they can't. That's all in state law. And then those state licensing rules relate back to Medicare because, of course, a licensed provider under Social Security Act can seek reimbursement from Medicare under 1395X. And the gap is that Medicare won't, Medicare's reimbursement policies do not match those of states for telehealth reimbursement, right? The states, say, uh, most states, and I've read almost all the laws relating to physicians, nurse practitioners, physical therapists, and social workers, because that's Omada's verticals, do not necessarily say you can't use asynchronous technology. Some states expressly allow it, but Medicare won't pay for asynchronous visits. The state laws do not require particular technology to have the video conference if they require simultane simultaneous conferencing. But Medicare has, in part because congressional action, right? Medicare can't change what is set in statute and they've made that clear in this year's fee schedule. And so uh, I love my CDRH people, worked with them a lot, but they literally have nothing to say about telehealth because it's not in their jurisdiction. They don't have anything to say about privacy either. It's not in their jurisdiction. What they can do is regulate the safety and efficacy of the equipment that might be rendering signals in that telehealth setting. Right, that was my kind of, I'm sorry, I'm following up. No, no, it's okay. Myself. Right, so if you have um, within, again, back to this kind of April IFR for home health, they had this, they didn't give an example of what products maybe you know, provided by, or they didn't give a definition of what might be provided by telecommunications, but they gave a bunch of examples, one of which is kind of like a, like a biometric monitoring, basically, like an app that both, you know, is, gen would be considered general wellness under cures, but then also would provide some kind of biometric feedback. Um, and then, you know, where, <laughs> where does that live? So, you know, Laura, it's, it's, just let me the last thing on this, because I think this is also part of the way forward and what Lucia and I are thinking about. You know, even with all the broad authority that the, that the FDA has, it has stated publicly that it thinks it needs more authorities from Congress in order to do the job of digital. That literally is, I mean, it's in part the same problem with CMS um, and other payers, is that there are some functional tools that they need that Lucia and I think um, can be helpful in order to think about you know, providing the best kind of care, the best coverage, you know, doing it the most efficiently and for every stakeholder. And right now the system is just not set up to do that. And that's in essence where we think there are some good areas for Congress and the administration to partner together. And I know there's more questions, but I want to just say one more thing before we move on. 
I think if we, if Robert and I get the next phase of this right, and we're all interested in your input, it will, we'll be able to outline structures within CMS writ large that help it solve this problem for itself, because it kind of can't get out of its own way right now. Right. And, by and the your way, home health is a great example. Another is disconnects between RPM codes and OIG rules on value-based arrangements. And I know you have a question about that, David, and I hope we have time to get to it. Otherwise, you have my email. And I'm, I'm just going to say, too, look, people said that, that solving the SGR, the physician payment system, wasn't possible. Um, they said it for years. And then we did it. I was one of the staffers that did it. Lucian, and I, we have a really good idea here. It's, um, and frankly, it's tactical and it's considerate of the problems that a lot of you have raised today. Thank you very much. Laura, terrific questions. Thank you so much. Smith, I'm going to come to you first and then I'm going to make sure we also have time to get to you, David, um, and then you, Needy. So, Smith, you're up. Hi, perfect discussion and thank you so much, uh, Robin and Laura. My name is Smith. I'm a final year pharmacy student working as a consultant at Senda uh, in digital therapeutics and I apologize for the background noise. I'm in a clinic. Um, my question was the, in August that came out, the MCID pathway, um, and looking at the proposals, there were a lot of gray areas in terms of what they consider um, as a reasonable and necessary device. I wanted to just garner your thoughts around those and what you had, um, and appreciate all the thoughts. Thank you. Sure. We addressed that briefly in the blog, and I don't want to belabor the point because we have so many people here, and, and you know, you guys can all connect with us offline or on social media, but... That's a great step forward, but it's, an, it's very limited in scope to these breakthrough technologies that the FDA says are breakthrough technologies, which takes me right back to the last comment. The FDA has nothing to say for how physicians deliver their care, only the equipment they're using to deliver it. That's drugs and devices. And so if you have a physician using clinical decision support to enable them to do asynchronous care um, with this, these, uh, you know, AI and machine learning supporting what they're knowing about a person, that's not covered by that at all. So that's my answer there. I don't know if you want to add anything, Robert, or we should just go on. Well, just maybe two seconds. I think it's a good extension of the current system. So it accounts for the current problems. I think we're trying to solve those. So it's nice, but I think Lucian, I would say it, it can go a lot farther. There's a really nice sort of summation there, Robert, which is, you know, are we trying to, you know, stick fingers in the dam here? Or are we trying to really be transformational? Um, Smith, terrific question. Thank you. And thank you for joining us from clinic. David, would you like to unmute yourself and pose your question directly to Lucia and Robert? Thank you. And hello, everybody. I'm uh, David Harlow. I'm a, a, a recovering lawyer, lawyer and consultant. I'm uh, in the past year or so. I've uh, taken on a role as a, a chief compliance and privacy officer at a medical device company. Um, and I am, my question was really about, you know, as sort of a stepping stone to a sort of more holistic solution here, uh, this, this month, sort of the latest uh, arrival on the doorstep, the, you know, the thousand pages of rules on anti-kickback and Stark uh, that showed up a week or so ago. Um, has sort of the the possibility in there for greater collaboration between digital tool makers and clinicians, providers and payers, um, and the the notion of uh, uh, providing digital tools into the mix. Yeah. And while maybe this doesn't address Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare head on, it does create the opportunity, I think, for payer, provider, uh, digital tool maker, uh, value-based payment arrangements. And we do have these relatively new codes of uh, in the RPM um, arena, which seem to be related to the CCM arena. And maybe those are complementary, maybe not, haven't thought about it enough. But uh, I'm just sort of interested in, in how that sort of incremental step forward fits into the framework that you're talking about like I said, I recognize it's not the full leap forward, but does it get yeah. us a great deal of the way there? I don't think it gets us a great deal of the way. I think it starts to solve an inherent illogic. And um, I will say that I know a lot of organizations, I don't know if Dime Society, but I know ATA, I know OMADA, I know Digital Therapeutics, I know Advamed, all commented to OIG, 
a year ago now, it was last December, that excluding where a where something that produces a digital signal that is of sufficient caliber to constitute real world evidence falls on the DEMEPO schedule and was by proposal categorically excluded from being used in value-based arrangements, it just was stupid. And David- It was just stupid. And, and we quoted that in our blog because our blog was published before the rule came out. I understand there is a very narrow exception softening that that concept in the, the new rule. I haven't had a chance to dig in. I've been reading yeah, at very, some of the you know law firm analyses, whatever. We'll see how narrow or how broad that is. Um, but you can see the illogic of saying, well, because it's on this schedule, which has a history of fraud, not counting for digital record keeping, we're not gonna use it to generate real world evidence when we're otherwise making all of the business partners bear risk for the outcome. Just um, and, and David, maybe just the, the macro way to think about it is we all, like Lucia and I want to see incremental progress go forward. We'd like to see big progress go forward too. Under a modernized program, incremental progress will still need to be made. I guess the question is, where are you starting from? And Lucia and I would like to speed up a little bit or allow, I think, digital manufacturers to start from a more advantageous position so that all patients can take more advantage of the benefits that digitals provides. Thanks. Fantastic. David, a really terrific question. I appreciate it. Needy, would you like to um, unmute yourself and pose your question directly? Yes. Hey, uh, good, good article. And uh, so I had a question, uh, maybe a basic one, but as, the, as AI progresses and prediction models get better and say I'm using products, uh, variables like from Apple or Fitbit and they can identify trends now because the prediction is getting better that, okay, I might have a stroke or say AFib in the coming two years, just, just not like coming two years, but just going by the trend or uh, data that, that the uh, product is showing. So then at that point, do you think that I should be paying more insurance, paying more for my insurance because the product is now predicting that, okay, this person might have AFib at this point, or this person might have, um, is susceptible to stroke at this point. If I can start this one, Lucia, actually. So yeah. this is a really good example about the current approaches versus new approaches, right? That Lucia and I are talking about. The current approach, the system will look at this as an additive thing. And, and, and really what we want to get to is a place where the system can look at how can I incorporate that in a way to, to make improvements. So to your question of how do I maybe the thinking isn't just to talk about the potential, but to actually go a step farther like Lucia did in legislation on the Prevent Diabetes Act and identify how the program can best take advantage so that it benefits the program and it benefits beneficiaries and it benefits your company as a consequence because now your incentives are completely aligned. And that frankly is I, what Lucia and I think is the big problem that a lot of folks run into they don't think about, they don't take the time to think about, okay, I know why this is gonna be good for me, but here's why it's good for you too, Medicare program. The, the other thing I would say about that, and Robert actually knows the Medicare rules probably a little bit better than I do, but my understanding is that Medicare premiums vary by region, but not by individual health status. And that's a policy design of the Medicare system. And it's very similar to the ACA policy design where we as a country so far, have said we don't want to ding people because they uh, were had a pre-existing health condition. It's a policy question whether you ding people because um, a Fitbit or any digital tool predicts a health outcome that might come to pass and might not come to pass. That's a policy question about what you charge people. My personal view is that for something like the predictive analytics for AFib, what you should use that for is what I referred to earlier is when does the intense acute care hospital setting need to swoop in to prevent uh, uh, emerging health situation from becoming worse? Not should we charge people more because that might happen to them. The point of insurance is that we spread the risk across the entire 340 million of us, not make one person bear extra risk by paying extra premiums. But that's a policy choice that literally is kind of out of scope for what we're working on. That um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure 
somebody will make that argument. Some smart health plan will want to do that. But right now, my understanding is it's not allowed. And honestly, if, if we do what we intend to do, um, basically the system is better and then insurance right follows along or wraps around it and then makes the access. So it's, yeah. And, and to a certain extent, if I made things even go the other way, right? If you have a risk adjusted payment to a Medicare Advantage plan that's based on the risks of the enrollees, so right. there's a recognition that, you know, we throw a few more bucks at somebody to manage more complicated care. Right. And then, you know, as you think about just how digital can be used by stakeholders, right? From the provider community, digital and expanded use of digital can help them better manage risk under new models of care that have risk assigned. So it's, you know, if we get the right system, digital can work for everybody better. And we don't need to get, in, get into the stakeholder on stakeholder fights that we've seen in the past. Uh, that was exactly the point of the comment so many people made to OIG was you want people to manage risk, but you're cutting them off at the knees with the tools that they could best use to do that. Right, well said. That is a terrific note to close on. This, um, these journal club sessions are absolutely the favorite in all of our programming here at Dime. Lucia and Robert, you were tremendous. Just a couple of things. There's some great comments by Rob and Laura in the chat that I encourage you all to take a quick look at while I close this out. Um, I, Lucia and Robert, you've alluded several times, which is phenomenal, that this um, terrific blog post is just the start of a sort of longer term vision that, um, that you have. That is very exciting. I have in my mind, um, there's a meme that's, you know, something like there's nine standards and everyone thinks there needs to be, you know, just one and they go into a room and you come out and there's 10 standards. So whatever we can do, I'm volunteering folks on the line in the Dime community to make sure that we don't go into a room and come out with a 10 pronged approach to Medicare. We are here to support you. Thank you for taking the time with us today. For folks who enjoyed the conversation, just a couple of uh, items on our upcoming programming. Um, we've got a webinar next week thinking about getting a terrific digital concept uh, or a digital product from concept to commercialization. Join us if you can. Rachel, who's on the line, will be moderating that. We also have Journal Club next month where we'll have colleagues from the AMA, Change Healthcare, Mass Challenge, MITRE, and Mass Quality Health Partners reporting on a, a nationwide physician survey on uh, telehealth. And um, Lucia, I too wish Anne had been here. So I want to make sure we finish on time. Thank you everyone for dialing in and for such a wonderful conversation. This is so important for knowledge exchange and shared learning. Lucia and Robert, congratulations on a wonderful piece. We are here for you as you continue to push this vision ahead. I think there's broad support from everyone on the line um, and appreciate everyone taking the time to dial in this lunchtime. Thanks everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.